Hello, and welcome back. Today I want to take a closer look at what social scientists do. And again, it's not really that different from what ordinary people do without any formal education or training. Uh, social scientists like yourself observe and investigate things. Uh, they make certain assumptions about people. They use tools, uh, albeit not as formal, not as systematic, maybe not the same tools that scientists use, but tools nevertheless, like logic and common sense. They're guided by perspectives and theories. Granted, they may not always be scientific or formal theories, but perspectives and theories nonetheless. They create and use hypotheses to help them understand how and why humans behave the way they do. They use various methods of data collection, and of course they report their findings. Not necessarily in academic journals, but average people report their findings nevertheless to friends, family, or anyone else who will listen. Now, if you recall, <clears throat> we've already talked about what psych psychologists are interested in. And if you notice on the screen, they're interested in a lot of the same things you're interested in. Personality, relationships, charity, mental illness, hate. We also looked at the different tools that psychologists use in an effort to understand human behavior. And many of these tools that they use look an awful lot like the ones you rely upon. Common sense, intuition, logic, and appeal to authority, to name but a few. But if you notice, there's one tool at the bottom that is a bit different. One tool at the bottom that is more formal, one tool at the bottom that scientists rely upon way more heavily than the average person, and that is called the scientific method. And we're going to talk about that in some detail today. What are these assumptions that scientists make? Well, the assumption primarily is that humans have a nature, that that nature is knowable, and that this knowledge can be gained or discovered through empirical research. That is, research that is based upon things you can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, sometimes known as palatable evidence, or palpable, excuse me, evidence. And finally, good ideas are testable. Uh, that is, that they are falsifiable. More on that distinction a bit later when we talk about predictions hypotheses. Again, I've mentioned the scientific method is not only what scientists use, but it is the best tool that scientists can use for the job of understanding human behavior or understanding anything else in the universe for that matter. Why? Well, we've already mentioned that it's a systematic process, it minimizes bias, it's apolitical, it's error correcting, it yields tentative findings, not absolute truths with a big T, it's open to criticism, it focuses on testing ideas, not confirming biases or conclusions. And of course, finally, it's the most powerful approach to getting at the truth with a little t, getting at an approximation of the truth, getting at what we call provisional truth. We also talked about the different theoretical perspectives. These are the giant frameworks starting back in the 1870s with Wilhelm Wundt and structuralism, moving towards the current present day with evolutionary and biological methods or th theoretical perspectives. Remember, theoretical perspectives rely upon testing. And what is it that we use to test the merit of a theoretical perspective? How do we know if a theoretical perspective is good at meeting those four goals we talked about earlier, description, prediction, explanation, and control? And the answer is you have to put them to the test with theories. And a theory is basically two things. A theory is a set of assumptions designed to bring together seemingly disparate or different ideas. And a theory is also that thing which you use to test the merit or the power of a theoretical perspective. Now just consider something like procrastination, right? The tendency for people to wait to the last minute or even wait until a due date elapses before they even start, let alone complete an assignment. Now there's lots of different explanations or what we might call theories for why this happens. Maybe it happens because people are lazy. 
Maybe it happens because people are anxious. Maybe it happens because people are forgetful. Or maybe it happens because people are distractible. Or maybe it happens for any other number of theoretical reasons. Now, in order to test a theory, you have to make a prediction, what we call in science a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is exactly what we need to test the merit of this theory. And why do we need it? We need it because we want to be confident that the theory we're using to test the theoretical perspective is likewise meritorious, is likewise powerful. And how will we know if it's powerful? Well, the theory should describe, explain, predict, and also control these seemingly disparate or different observations. Again, take procrastination, for instance. People procrastinate in all sorts of areas of their life. They procrastinate in paying their bills. They procrastinate in going to the gym or otherwise exercising. They procrastinate in visiting their uh, elderly loved ones at the nursing home. They procrastinate at buying Christmas gifts. They procrastinate at uh, making a savings for retirement. They procrastinate at getting schoolwork done. They procrastinate at getting work on their job done, etc., etc. Now, again, a good theory is one that makes sense of all of these different observations about, say, procrastination. And again, in this example, it could be based upon the theory of laziness, anxiety, forgetfulness, distractibility, or some other theory. In order to put that theory to the test, I've already said you have to make a formal hypothesis, which is nothing more than a testable prediction. In order to generate a hypothesis, you have to come up with very specific definitions of your variables. So in the case of procrastination, we have to be very specific about how we're going to measure procrastination and how we're going to measure this element of the theory, whether it be laziness, anxiety, forgetfulness, or distractibility. And you'll want to pick one. An operational definition, then, is a procedure agreed upon for translation of a concept into a measurement of some kind. In other words, an operational definition, unlike a dictionary definition, is quantifiable. It's mathematical. It's scalable. Take a look here. E.L. Thorndike said, if a thing exists, it exists in some amount. And if it exists in some amount, it can be measured. Now, this is the hiccup with so many psychological, emotional phenomena. Consider procrastination. If you were to look that up in a dictionary, it would give you some sort of soft, subjective, wordsmithed definition that sounds very obscure, maybe even abstract or rhetorical. Certainly not the kind of definition you'd need if you wanted to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, or otherwise make concrete comparisons across groups of people regarding this trait or this phenomenon known as procrastination. But I think we can all agree that whether we're talking about procrastination or something even more difficult to define like prejudice or motivation, I think we can all agree that each of those differs in amount, in intensity, between one person and another. And if that is the case, then it should be measurable. Remember, operational definitions are just clear, objective, and measurable, preferably numerical or otherwise scalable and standardized. Now let's try to generate a few operational definitions of our own. Let's consider popularity first. Again, to contrast an operational definition with one in the dictionary. If you look up popularity in the dictionary, it's going to be kind of amorphous. It's going to basically be like a cat chasing its tail. Popularity is basically being popular. Popularity is when people recognize you. 
like you, hold you in esteem. But that doesn't do what we need it to do if we're looking to describe, explain, predict, and control human behavior. That doesn't do what we need it to do if we're trying to do the process of science. We need an operational definition. So we need to think in terms of, are some people more popular than others? By how much are some people more popular than others? Let's take a look at a social media platform like TikTok. You can actually track how popular a person is on TikTok. If you notice, Charlie, Charlie D'Amelio has 55.4 million followers right now. 55.4 million followers. That's how popular Charlie D'Amelio is on TikTok. By comparison, if you look way down to the bottom of the chart, so far down the bottom of the chart that you don't even see Jason McCoy, you'll learn that he has one, maybe two TikTok followers. So, by comparison, Charlie D'Amelio is 55 million, 399,000, 998 or 99 followers more popular on TikTok than Jason McCoy is. What about mean? We use the word, we understand the concept intuitively. Some people are mean, some people are not mean, some people are meaner than others. But is there a way to actually test or otherwise operationally define mean? Is there a way to define it so that it can be scaled, so that it can be um, quantified in a way where people can be added and subtracted and compared and divided by meanness? Well, Paul Piff, a psychologist from the University of California, Berkeley, has spent most of his career looking at concepts like mean. And specifically, he's got a theory that money and power make you mean. Let's take a look. I want you to, for a moment, think about playing a game of Monopoly. Except this game's been rigged, and you've got the upper hand. We brought in more than 100 pairs of strangers into the lab, and with the flip of a coin, randomly assigned one of the two to be a rich player in a rigged game. They got two times as much money. When they passed go, they collected twice the salary, and they got to roll both dice instead of one, so they got to move around the board a lot more. As the game unfolded, we saw dramatic differences begin to emerge between the two players. The rich player started to move around the board louder, literally smacking the board with their piece as he went around. Less and less sensitive to the plight of those poor, poor players, more likely to showcase how well they're doing. Now, this game of Monopoly can be used as a metaphor for understanding society, wherein some people have a lot of wealth and a lot of status, and a lot of people don't. What we've been finding is that as a person's levels of wealth increase, their feelings of compassion and empathy go down and their feelings of entitlement, of deservingness, increases. Wealthier individuals are more likely to endorse unethical behavior at work, like stealing cash from the cash register, taking bribes, lying to customers. The wealthier you are, the more likely you are to pursue a vision of personal success to the detriment of others around you. But we've been finding that small changes to people's values can restore levels of egalitarianism and empathy. For instance, reminding people of the benefits of cooperation or the advantages of community cause wealthier individuals to be just as egalitarian as poor people. So, how would we design our own study? I mean, in plain language, you'd start by asking yourself what you're interested in. And I think you guys would agree that I'm interested in a lot of the same things that average people are interested in. Say, procrastination, for instance. Then you think as specifically as you can about it. Next, you use your understanding of others' understanding to guide you. 
you come up with a potential explanation. You put that explanation or that reason to a test, and then you talk to others about what you find. Again, I'm very interested in procrastination. Why? Because it's everywhere. Because it's literally ubiquitous. It's in everything we do. Just take a look at the data in the chart above. Getting around to it. A study based on 10 years of research shows that procrastination among Americans is on the rise, making people poorer, fatter, and unhappier. So there are many pieces of evidence out there suggesting that procrastination is not only commonplace, but it's actually a detriment to your health. It's a detriment to your success. Now, there's a lot of theories as to why people procrastinate to begin with. One that I'm fascinated by is a theory of mood or theory of mental health. You can see from the chart below that as procrastination increases, so too does anxiety. Now, if this is true, we should be able to put this to the test and find data to support it. So, what are we going to wish we knew? We're going to wish we knew why people procrastinate. What are we going to think about in terms of investigating it? Well, we're going to think about testing ourselves, testing our classmates. What perspective and theories are we going to use to guide us? Well, we're going to use a biological perspective. And remember, the biological perspective says that we behave the way we do because of internal, physiological, anatomical, genetic, hormonal reasons. And what is the hypothesis going to be? <clears throat> Excuse me, what is the theory going to be that's based upon this biological perspective? Well, we're going to look at our emotional states. Most people believe that your emotional state is the result of your biological underpinnings. So, if this is the case, what we should see when we put this theory to the test is that, in fact, emotionality, specifically anxiety, correlates with increased levels of procrastination. So we now have to generate a testable hypothesis. Again, not an educated guess, but a very specific prediction. People who are the most anxious will procrastinate the most. Uh, that's a good claim. That's a possible testable hypothesis. But again, we won't know that specifically as to whether or not it can be tested until we can operationally define the variables we're interested in. And if we can do that, then we'll run an investigation and collect data. That means we'll select a method or methods of data collection, like for instance, maybe a survey. And finally, we'll report our findings will show the world our findings. And at the very end, we'll discuss and report any alternative explanations for these findings. Now again, I said a hypothesis is more than an educated guess. It's a testable prediction that emerges from a theory in an effort to test that theory. So, procrastination. The theory we're looking at, out of the four I mentioned earlier, laziness, emotion, distractibility, forgetfulness, we're going to use emotion. Now, remember that your variables within a hypothesis must be operationally defined. So the first thing we're going to do is try to find a way to scale or otherwise quantify our variables. How do we scale or quantify procrastination? And since we're looking at emotion, how would we scale and, quanti and or quantify emotion? We're also going to frame our hypothesis in the null or as a negative. Instead of saying that we believe anxiety is going to cause or going to correlate with procrastination, we'll say that anxiety, that emotion should not or will not have an effect on a person's tendency to procrastinate. You'll see why this matters later. We're going to state our hypothesis not only as a null, but we're also going to state it in an if-then format. If a person has higher levels of anxiety, then that person will be no more likely to procrastinate than anyone else. Notice that I put the hypothesis in an if-then format, and I also, also formatted it as a null or a negative. Next, 
Effort is going to be made when you're testing this to falsify your claim. You're trying to prove yourself false. This means that instead of starting with a conclusion and looking for evidence that supports your conclusion, if you remember from the first day of lecture, what we call confirmation bias, the way around that is to start with a null, start with the I don't think this is going to happen and try to prove that wrong. Now, when I say prove, I don't actually mean prove. We don't actually prove anything when we're doing science. We can only reject our null hypothesis or we can fail to reject the null hypothesis. You're never really accepting the alternative hypothesis just because you've falsified the null. Do you understand? If we don't find any evidence that falsifies our hypothesis, that does not mean we accept the alternative. You'll see what I mean later. Now, one more time altogether. How do perspectives, theories, and hypotheses, three terms you've probably heard, but you've never heard them together like this, how do they relate? Remember, perspectives are overarching frameworks from which social scientists think about how to test ideas. It's how we guide our thinking. Perspectives are tested using theories. The merit of a perspective is, is determined by the power of a theory that grows from that perspective. So for instance, theories are specific sets of assumptions used to make sense of otherwise unconnected ideas. And these theories, again, are the way perspectives are testing, tested. Remember, we selected emotion, specifically anxiety, as our theory of procrastination. We used a biological perspective. How will we know if the biological perspective has merit when trying to understand, explain, predict, and control procrastination? Well, that's going to depend upon the power of the theory, specifically our theory of emotion slash anxiety. Now, because emotion and even anxiety are pretty general terms, pretty abstract terms, we have to go a level further. We have to put the theory to the test. And this is where the hypothesis comes into play again. Hypotheses, again, are testable predictions used to determine the value of a theory. We believe a person's emotional state is a predictor of their tendency to procrastinate. Now, of course, if you remember, we're not going to actually write that hypothesis in that way. Remember, from B, we have to frame it in the null. So, let's try this again, framed as a null. We believe that a person's emotional state is not a predictor of their tendency to procrastinate. Now, we will go from there to test this idea and try to falsify that null hypothesis. Now, once you've got the hypothesis operationalized, once we know exactly how we want to measure emotion or anxiety in this case, we have to select a method or several methods of data collection. Uh, these are merely tools for collecting evidence. And there's three general types, descriptive methods, correlational methods, and experimental methods. Descriptive methods are exactly the way they sound. They describe what is going on. They describe what someone is doing. Correlational methods give us insight into how things relate to one another. And finally, the experimental method is the only method that allows us to answer the question, why is this happening? Sometimes referred to as cause and effect or causality. Now, the data that we collect can be quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative data yields numbers, yields measurements that are numerically based. Qualitative data does not always yield numbers. It yields kind. It yields 
uh, differences in kind. Qualitative data is about differences in things that are not necessarily obviously numerically based or scalable. Let me give you an example of a quantitative versus qualitative type of data. Consider your favorite author. What makes that author your favorite author? Chances are most people say, because I like the way that author writes. I like the way that author tells the story. And if I were to say, but does that mean it's a good author? You may say, well, yeah, because I like it. And I may say, but what if only you like that author? Does that make that author really a good author? I mean, what about other people? What if that author is not liked by hardly anyone else? In this case, you'd be making the claim that the author is a good author because they appeal to you. That is very qualitative. However, because that author is not liked by anyone else, I would be arguing that there's no quantitative data or no quantitative reason for us to believe that the author is a good author. Now, in the same vein, you could say, well, there are plenty of authors out there who have been on bestseller lists. There are plenty of authors out there who have written tons and tons and tons of works that by any other measure, the books are just garbage. Yes, they're popular. Yes, a lot of people have read them. But that does not mean the author is good. Qualitatively, that does not mean the author is of a different level or a different kind of author. The same goes with acting. Does anyone really believe that Will Ferrell is as good an actor as Benicio Del Toro? Benicio Del Toro has picked the majority of his films, way fewer, by the way, than Will Ferrell, very carefully. To my knowledge, Will Ferrell's never, ever been nominated for an Academy Award. But he does and has appeared in way more movies than almost anyone who has an Academy Award. Now, a closer look at data collection. I said that descriptive methods of data collection tell us what. And there are three general ways to determine what is going on. You can use a survey, you can use a case study, or you can use a naturalistic observation. You can also use correlational studies to determine how things are related. So for instance, in our procrastination study, how does procrastination relate to emotion, specifically to anxiety levels? We would use correlational methodology if we were trying to determine the extent to which those two phenomena or those two variables correlated or were related. And finally, experiments. Experiments are done if and when it is ethical to do so, and also if and when you want to know why something occurred. If you want to know if one variable caused another variable. Again, with a correlation, you're only able to tell that, say, procrastination and anxiety relate as anxiety levels go up, so too does procrastination. But since you don't have experimental data in a correlational study, you don't know, for instance, if the procrastination levels went up as a result of the anxiety or if they went up and anxiety went up as a result of something else, some hidden third variable or what we call the missing variable. So remember, correlations tell us how things relate, but they don't tell us why things relate. One thing to remember is correlation does not equal causation. Now, <clears throat> should you try and procrastinate your way to success? If we use the operational definition of procrastination that I have on the screen, how long it takes to complete an assignment in minutes after it's officially assigned, you can see that it appears as though the more you procrastinate, the lower your Learn Smart course 
average is, right? So people who got started on their Learn Smarts the quickest, say between zero and 200 minutes after it was assigned, have a higher course average than people who started at 200 to 900 minutes after it was assigned. Now, there are even people who started their assignment before it was officially assigned. Uh, they were online looking around at Blackboard and saw these assignments and got started before I made the official assignment in class. Uh, these people on average do even better than everyone else. Now again, does this mean or can we interpret from this data that procrastination causes poor grades or vice versa? Can we make the claim that the less procrastinating you engage in, the higher your course average will be? No, of course not. This is merely an average. This is merely a pattern. This is merely a relationship between two variables. And speaking of relationships between two variables, understand that correlations can reveal various relationships between things. Now, if you take a look at the screen, you notice that correlations can be graphed, correlations can be explained using numbers or what we call statistical coefficients from one on the left-hand side of the screen to negative one on the right-hand side of the screen. And of course, correlations can also be showcased or understood in terms of um, a type of language. Again, if we take a look at the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you see the chart that says perfect positive correlation. Correlations can be positive or they can be negative. Just take a look at the right-hand part of the screen. Perfect negative correlation. Now, perfect implies that there could be correlations that are not perfect. There could be correlations that are high or that are low or that are weak. It turns out, it turns out that correlations can be both positive and negative, and they can also be strong, that is, close to one or negative one, and they can be moderate or they can be weak, closer to zero. A correlation, again, is just a statistical relationship between two variables. This relationship is expressed as a numerical, that is a decimal coefficient, ranging from negative one to one. And again, the negative one does not mean weak. Negative one is actually very strong. Negative one just means that it is a negative correlation. More on that in a moment. The relationship can vary again from weak, zero is the weakest, meaning no correlation, to strong, actually to perfect, negative one or one. The direction of this relationship can be positive or negative. A positive relationship looks like those three charts on your left. Negative relationships, when graphed, look like those three charts on your right. Let's take a look at the bottom right-hand part of your screen. I've graphed height among different students in a class and their self-esteem. Now, according to this scatter plot, as we call it, where each dot is a person in my class from several semesters ago, and the axis on the bottom, known as the x-axis, that represents height in inches, is an indication of each person's height in inches, and the y-axis, which is running vertical, self-esteem, measured from the lowest, which is a one, and the highest, which is a five, you can see the relationship between each person in the class, one dot, the relationship between that person's self-esteem and height. And as a general rule, you notice if we draw a line through these dots from the bottom left of the screen to the top right, the lines generally move sort of in that direction from bottom left to top right. Now take a look at the the graphs above and see which of these seven scatter plots or graphs above most look like the one here between self-esteem and height. If you said low positive correlation, you'd be correct. You'd be correct. 
meaning there's a low or weak relationship, maybe even moderate relationship, between height and self-esteem as measured by the handful of students I measured in one of my classes several semesters ago. Now, even if you have nearly perfect or perfect correlations, right? Even if there were a perfect correlation, if all the dots fit on that line between height and self-esteem across all the students in my class several semesters ago, that would not mean necessarily what you think it means. That would not mean that being tall makes you like yourself more or have self-esteem. No, it just means that on average, the taller people are, the higher they report their self-esteem. Correlation is not causation. Notice the chart to the left. Ice cream sales in blue mirrored by shark attacks in red. What in the world do these two things have in common? Certainly you couldn't say ice cream sales cause shark attacks or shark attacks cause ice cream sales. No, both ice cream sales and shark attacks increase because of a third or missing variable. What is that variable? The weather. It's hot and sunny. They don't cause each other. They're possibly caused by something else. Take a look on the right. Divorce rate in Maine correlates with the per capita consumption of margarine in the U.S. Those numbers are strikingly similar. Take a look from 2000 to 2009 at the chart to the right. The divorce rate in Maine tracks the amount of margarine families consume across the United States in that same year. Are we to believe that divorce causes people to go out and buy more margarine? Are we to believe that margarine consumption causes people to get divorced? Or is there some other variable that we are not seeing because of the limitation of a correlational study. This little mathographic or metagraphic um, should remind you in kind of a summary of everything we just talked about regarding correlations. So take a look at this at your leisure and this will be very, very helpful going forward in the class. Now finally, the gold standard the most powerful method of data collection. It is called the experiment or the experimental method. Why is it the most powerful method of data collection? Because this is the only method that tests for causality or what we call cause and effect. This is the only method that can help us get to why something happened. It uses special variables called independent and dependent variables. It offers precision and control. It compares two or more groups of participants. And before you can compare these participants, it randomly selects and assigns these participants into these groups. What do I mean by random assignment and random selection? What I mean by random selection is that everybody who should potentially be studied have an equal opportunity to be part of the research study. What do I mean by random assignment? That everybody in the study who have already been selected have an equal opportunity to be in one group or the other. In experiments, we call these control groups and experimental groups. Again, random assignment is like shuffling cards. Why do we shuffle cards? Because we want to make sure that the chance of getting any particular card, the two of hearts, the ace of spades, the queen of diamonds, is equally distributed throughout everybody playing the game, no matter when the dealer deals to them, first, second, third, or last. And likewise, when people are being placed into control groups and experimental groups, we want to make sure that their chance of being placed in either or has nothing to do with the order in which they were placed, has nothing to do with anything 
or any reason or any trait that they came into the study with. We want to make sure when doing experiments that the only thing that systematically differs between one group versus the other is what we call the independent variable. It's the variable that the experimenter is controlling and testing. Again, experiments allow us to discover cause and effect. What is the difference between a correlational study and an experiment? Just that. Why use an experiment? Because we want more power, more control. We want to be able to say with some level of precision that A caused B. And when you can't use an experimental method, you may use a correlation, which is oftentimes the next best thing. Why couldn't you use an experimental method? Perhaps you don't have the ethical clearance to do it. Perhaps you have reason to believe that one of the groups might benefit from the variable you're manipulating, but perhaps the other group might actually be harmed in some way. And that leads me to one of my last topics, ethical considerations. If you read through your chapter or your first chapters, you'll notice several ethical considerations that researchers must keep in mind when doing their investigations. Confidentiality, debriefing, Basically, <clears throat> ethical considerations suggest that you as the researcher should remember to never do any harm, physical, psychological, or otherwise. And when you're trying to determine whether or not the study as you've mapped it out is a good study, you have to consider whether or not it's also ethical. And because we are biased, particularly when we have our own pet theories and ideas and we have our own internal motivations, because we are biased, we may have the tendency to believe that something is worth the level of deception we want to use, that something is worth the uh, ethical problem that might exist. For that reason, we turn to internal review boards or IRBs. Professors, Researchers, scholars should not engage in research activities that require live human participants or really even animal participants without a group of people, sometimes from the community, sometimes from the school, sometimes from both, to review that protocol, to review that proposal and determine whether or not the harm outweighs the potential good. If you want to see all of this together, I recommend you take a look at the film that I have linked here entitled Research and Experimentation. It's about 20 minutes and it's from a series of cartoon videos put forth by uh, the Green Brothers known as Crash Course Psychology. Uh, this one is a particularly good one, and I am just going to let it play as our video runs out. Thank you guys again for your attention. I appreciate it. And don't forget to email me if and when you have any questions. The next chapter we're going to cover is Social Psychology, Chapter 14. Be ready Max for that on Media, Monday. The best choice for your qualitative and mixed methods research. Do you love boating? Well, Freedom Boat Club makes boating easier than ever. At Freedom Boat Club, we buy the boats and you enjoy them. Here's how it works.
Can we go pizza cause psychedelic hallucinations? Does coffee make you smarter? Or does it just make you do dumb stuff faster? Like bunch of psychology itself, questions like these can seem pretty intuitive. I mean, people may not be the easiest organisms to understand, but you're a person, right? So you must be qualified to draw, like, some conclusions about other people and what makes them tick. But it's important to realize that your intuition isn't always right. In fact, sometimes it is exactly wrong, and we tend to grossly underestimate the dangers of false intuition. If you have some idea about a person and their behavior that turns out to be right, that reinforces your trust in your intuition. Like if I warn my buddy Bob against eating that deep dish pizza that's been in the fridge for the past week, but he eats it anyway and soon starts to wig out, I'm gonna say, dude, I told you so. But if I'm wrong and he's totally fine, I probably won't even think about it ever again. This is known as hindsight bias, or the I knew it all along phenomenon. This doesn't mean that common sense is wrong, it just means that our intuitive sense more easily describes what just happened than what will happen in the future. Another reason you can't blindly trust your intuition is your natural tendency toward overconfidence. Sometimes you just really, really feel like you're right about people when actually you're really, really wrong. We've all been there. We also tend to perceive order and random events, which can lead to false assumptions. For example, if you flip a coin five times, you have equal chances of getting all tails as you do getting alternating heads and tails. But we see the series of five tails as something unusual, as a streak, and thus giving that result some kind of meaning that it very definitely does not have. That is why we have the methods and safeguards of psychological research and experimentation, and the glorious process of scientific inquiry. They help us to get around these problems and basically save the study of our minds from the stupidity of our minds. So I hope that it won't be a spoiler if I tell you now that pizza won't make you trip and coffee doesn't make you smart. Sorry. <laughs>